Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Inside Jerry's Brain. We are, uh, the date is Monday, September 2nd. Uh, Hurricane Dorian is closing in on Florida, albeit very slowly. Uh, one of our guests here is, is actually lives on the Outer Banks and has been told that should this thing stay strong and keep going, he may have to leave home, but that's a couple of days away. Uh, we are, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer my apology right now that occasionally I will interrupt when somebody is talking and show things in my brain that I believe to be relevant to whatever it is they are saying. This is not my trying to upstage them, but rather within the limits of Zoom technology, my trying to co contribute to the conversation. And I'm very happy to hear other people and uh, uh, about things that we'd like to add to this context. And also, if you want to share your screen with uh, whatever it is you're looking at, I would love that as well. Um, so given that start, the, the, I just did this, uh, I just uh, set this call up as a show and tell because we haven't had an Inside Jury's Brain call for a while, <clears throat> for which my apologies. And I think that we are all like nostril deep in things that uh, we're passionate about, frustrated about, uh, you know, busy working on, and it would be really just nice to hear what those things are. And I also have a hunch that the thing that one of us is stuck on, uh, a, a different one of us might actually have uh, a little bit of WD-44, so mental WD-40. So maybe we can figure our way uh, through to loosen up the, the lock nuts and, and uh, make some a little bit of progress here. Uh, with that, I'm going to just see if anybody would like to step in and talk about something that's uh, like top of mind for them. And, and you all don't know one another. So maybe that's a, a let's just do a really quick go around and say where we are, who we are, and uh, what, what's, you know, what we care about. Um, Doug, do you want to start? Well, sure. I live on the Russian River, uh, north of San Francisco. I'm by background a physicist and then a psychoanalyst studied with Eric Fromm and doing a lot of consulting ever since, which takes me into my current thing, which is looking at what we do about the economy since it's broken and the politics that fix it is broken. So there's a lot to think about and that's what I do. Thank you very much. Bobby? Uh, hi, uh, I'm in interested in systemic change these days and approaching that from the perspective of what are the underutilized capacities in the world, whether the global volunteer community or the ability to prevent harm and recycle that to pay for social innovation. And we've been creating a series of social innovation oriented research uh, collaborative initiatives on topics from biophilia in hospitals and cities, which pay for themselves with 100 outcomes uh, of consequence or uh, medicinal foods for stress, sleep and anxiety, uh, citizen science, data science or forest fire prevention derivatives and reinsurance prevention of risk. So looking at that for uh, flooding prevention through coral reefs health and forest fire prevention. We're looking at zero subsidy affordable housing. Effectively each of the areas is a context where there's an economic radically underutilized combination of capacities that makes it possible to have some kind of utopianization or optimization towards social innovation scaling to the scale of sustainable development goals and beyond as GAP. And we've been orienting in th that kind of portfolio of directions. Um, thank you. I think I, I think I first ever heard of social impact bonds from you and, and a bunch of things. You're always kind of, you're, you're always exploring the, the systems perspective on, on interesting social problems and kind of complex networks or complex solutions that, that uh, uh, can, can sort some of these things out. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Um, uh, Jean? Yeah. I live on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. My wife is hollering. What? Oh, what? They're showing 100 mile an hour winds Friday morning. Uh, okay. Oh, not so fast. News, news reports. Um, I live on the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the hurricane is on its way. Personally, I'm a recovering systems thinker. Um, Hi, Gene. And everybody, everybody missed the cue. I'm a recovering. <laughs> from, from AA, you're supposed to say hi in their first name. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah. And so that's, on my way to, to try to figure out how to become a storyteller as opposed to a systems thinker. Gene is also a black belt Kumu user. Uh, Kumu is a systems diagramming app that is quite brilliant. 
uh, he made a very good faith effort to train me up in Kumu, but my brain is so solidly welded to uh, the brain that I was unable to begin thinking differently, which was an, an interesting lesson to me. Um, at, and, and, and to add to that, I had a 21-year love-hate relationship with the brain. With the brain as well. Because, you like uninstalled it four times or something? Oh, more than that. Yeah. Because I really wanted it to be Kumu and it was never going to be. So, But now I figured out what it's really good for. So I'm, I'm now an advocate for the brain too. Love that. And, uh, Ken Howard, thanks for joining. Howard was also on this morning's call. We're just checking in really briefly and then we'll go dive in on whatever anybody's uh, – you know, really interested in and would like to put on the table. Uh, Michael, where, what, how? This is just a quick check-in. Um, west coast of Canada, Vancouver Island. Uh, um, been involved with community currency systems for something near 37 years now. Um, and I think we've just found the magic element, the, the final piece of the puzzle. So um, I'm, I'm rather distracted by uh, the oddness of not seeing what was sitting right in front of me for the last 30 years. Well, that sounds awfully promising. I'm curious and uh, eager. So um, I, I just realized that um, pretty much all of you are in my brain. Uh, and I, I should, given that this is an inside Jerry's brain call, maybe it would be appropriate for me to share out what you look like in my brain. So here's, here's Michael. Um, Let's look up Bobby. Bobby's been hosting a visionaries and revolutionaries uh, hike and get togethers for a really, well, how many years now? Uh, well, since, uh, well, the hike uh, came out of meeting uh, David Hodgson at your retreat years ago, Jerry. So you're uh, responsible for more than 50 hikes that happened since that wouldn't have happened if Hodgson and I hadn't co-conspired there. That's but, hilarious. Uh, and then here's Doug. Each of you are richly, richly woven into this context. I mean, there's a... Uh, And then here's Jean. I've got you under Kumu Black Belts, <coughs> Systems Thinkers, the Visualization Posse. Uh, the Visualization Posse is everyone I've ever met who would be great to have in a conversation about a visual sense-making um, environment, for example. And uh, Ken, would you jump in? Hello, Ken Homer calling in from San Rafael, California, out in my garden, enjoying the waning days of summer. Um, just always happy to be on a Jerry's Brain call. There's such interesting people and things to be um, explored here. So happy to be here today. Awesome. awesome. Um, and here's uh, World Cafe, Cafe Facilitators. Uh, collaborative Conversations is kind of Ken's, I think, central, central gig. Uh, um, and Ken has been sort of our lead guest on a couple of these calls, uh, talking about somatic um, experiences, basically, how do we, um, how do we manage to figure that out? John, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, John Grant, I'm based in the northwest of England near Manchester. I'm a software engineer by training. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur for the past 15 years involved with data science, looking at the skills in the IT job market. I'm interested in the future of work, uh, automation, machine intelligence, and the impact that will have on the future of work. Uh, Kinefin, complexity science, worldly mapping. And really today I'm here to listen and hopefully ask some questions. Beautiful. Here's Kenevin, just as a, as a, how we go. Um, and Howard, do you mind checking in? I just wanted to, oh. please. 
Uh, I was just going to share, uh, mention the future of work and future of skills. We released a, a paper I just sent the, the link to in the chat around how the, the future of skills, if you look at each sub-industry, appears to be VUCA skills and that there's um, strategies for learning VUCA skills, perhaps associated with service learning, skilled volunteering in association with social innovation, but in general that the largest uh, institutions are all sort of identif self-identify as missing VUCA skills when when asked as largest risk to them. So th that linked the future of work, future of skills, future of skill gap and impact opportunity aligned to skill gap is uh, something I just uh, shared. Oh, you have a VUCA section. That's oh, of true. course. Are you serious? Of course I've got VUCA. Well, and, and I've heard it pronounced VUCA, so who, who knows? I mean, it's a little like like GIF and GIF, I guess. Uh, there's also uh, VUCA 2, uh, Vision, Understanding, Collaboration, and Agility, which somebody else uh, uh, recommended. And then Jamey Cassio, uh, getting a little tired of VUCA, basically presented uh, Banny. There we go. Uh, brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible. So he basically says that we're actually not in a VUCA world, we're in a Banny world. So there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Um, now, Howard, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Well, this morning's call lingered uh, with me, so I thought I'd uh, join again. Um, I'm in Portland, like Jerry, Portland, Oregon, and uh, currently teaching at Pacific Northwest College of Art, um, teaching systems thinking and foresight, and um, enjoy working with um, younger folks. So here's PNCA, which is walking distance from where I'm sitting. Um, and then uh, Howard, you had sent the link to this, uh, this post of yours this morning, which I am not finished digesting. So I've I was actually following up the article that you refer to. And later I'm gonna curate a little bit more of that. But what I, what I was doing uh, was curating the thought for the call where I, I connected to, we talked about culture eat strategy for breakfast because wikis are very much about, about culture um system one and system two thinking etc uh, etc et so i'm i'm gonna garden it into the context more as uh as we go so i will stop the sharing it's actually i i can't tell you how pleasant it is that all everybody on the call is like richly represented in this context that i curate because because i don't know because it feels like i know some part of you and i can show some part of you to one another right, in a quick, efficient way that normally we don't get. Um, I remember many, many, many years ago, Jason Calacanis, who is now like a media phenomenon and conference thrower, he was like a skinny kid who would bring, come up the elevator, drop a bunch of mimeograph copies of Silicon Valley Reporter on our, on our front desk and, and escape down the elevator. Um, at one point, at the very beginning of when I could um, share my brain, when I was publishing my brain, he sent me an email and he said, Jerry, I just spent an hour in your brain and I think I learned more about you than I would have, learned, would, have, would have learned in five hours of conversation. And he had run across thoughts like things my dad taught me, uh, which don't come up in normal conversation, right? But he had just gone wandering and, and found a bunch of things, partly because I'm publishing pretty openly uh, a lot of these things. Um, so let me pause. And uh, we just heard a bunch of really interesting things. Anybody want to uh, talk about something they're chewing on? that might be of uh, shared interest. I want to hear what Michael figured out. Michael, I, there might, you're, you're muted right now. There might be a command performance uh, waiting here. Well, let's see what I can do in a short thing here. We, I've been on the money gig for a long time and that I see conventional money as an alien intervention. It's um, their money. It's not my money. It's never been my money. Um, and yet we've seen how locally organized or generally organized mutual credit, that is a bunch of agents interacting with each other and just keeping score. It's well, well seen, well defined, but it's never taken off very strongly. Although there are large business-to-business -business networks doing what are called commercial barter, um, I don't know, 20 billion a year or something is the current sort of status of that trade sector. 
if you go and talk to a bunch of businesses about having their own money, a chamber of commerce, Rotary Club or whatever, they run screaming for the hills. They, they panic. It's not inside their headset and they don't want to know about it. And we've been addressing this dilemma of how do you make it available to um, a business to understand the added value of having its, its own money. I mean, literally, a sort of a, a coupon that's issued by that business um, that's a successful supporter of a circularity in the economy that always therefore returns loyal customers to them. Very difficult to get that through people's heads because the sort of collective unintelligence of the business community is deep and profound. Uh, what they're not going to accept is very well established. And so we've had a lot of difficulty. We, now, we always used to think you had to approach it by going to a bunch of businesses, a bunch of nonprofits, a bunch of people, and setting up this complex roundabout deal, which was feasible, but took maybe $30,000 and three months of three good people's time to put together, and therefore didn't get a hell of a lot of pickup in the world, because although we could do it, we couldn't demonstrate that it was a lot of fun. There were references to the Wright brothers earlier in today's conversations that it, it's not so much whether you do it, it's how it is seen that you do it that makes the big difference. Well, we had to create a, a small scale community currency, very small scale in a hurry um, to demonstrate this idea to our local bar. Um, and instead of going around the big route that we've been using for years, we thought, well, listen, why not just um, print up a bunch of these coupons and have them in a bucket or a jug or jar on the counter. And there's a sign by it and it says, if you want to help the fire department, which is a volunteer in our department, in our part of the world, put cash in, in this bucket, take out one of our coupons, the cash will go to the fire department, bring your coupon to the till, buy your beer. Now, this is in one pass achieving the three components we've figured out as being pretty much essential to a business having credibility in monetary issue. One is that they must give the money away. You can't just try and um, spend it. You print money and try and spend it, you look like an idiot and nobody will buy into it. And you can't just give it away from a helicopter. You can't scatter dollar bills around town because that is obviously cheap and useless. But if you commit to service, like the, the body shop used to offer its staff two hours of paid work a week to go and help in a local charity or something. Well, it's a good idea because you're sort of by proxy lending your businesses slack time to the support of a, a charity or a, a project. But it's very inconvenient, very inefficient. It would be far better for the body shop to give a bunch of coupons to the charities and the charities could sell those coupons for cash and therefore be in position to look after their own needs. And the people who provided the cash have got coupons to go to the body shop. And that's our basic model. But trying to set it up as a three ring circus in three months was a pain in the butt. However, doing it with this stuff, um, it's Mickey Mouse. It's, it's so horribly simple, it's embarrassing. And my context from this morning's meeting was the way in which issues like this achieve um, velocity and um, contact in the world is very important. If it goes through Amazon, it's not the same as if it goes through the cooperative movement. And I would really much rather it went through the cooperative movement than Amazon. So I'm focusing most of my energy at the moment is how to, uh, having this cat now out of a bag, um, how do I want to, um, support its propagation. Uh, so that's, that's my current story and thought. Thank you. So just to, to, to try to reflect back some of what you're saying to see if I'm understanding it, it's a little, one little piece of it is just as banks create money by giving out loans, uh, you know, loans are effectively new money and they have to have fractional reserves to pay them back, but basically they're, they're inventing money through, through lending. Uh, in some sense, a, a merchant can invent money by creating coupons they're willing to honor that other people then purchase and 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 put it put into circulation, um, but but that original merchant has just made local currency. They've just, just 
made it out of whole cloth. They created a promise, which is everything that a money should be, but who's responsible for the promise inside one of these local localized or community networks, you hopefully have a bunch of businesses have been the issuers of this money and therefore it's underwriters and give the confidence to the general public that they can go to this bar and that grocery store and whatever. But it has to be achieved by genuine service. This is the, the, the mini magic that if the business just printed the money and took it for granted that it was a solid business, you will love my coupons, then they're going to find themselves up against some sort of a cognitive wall, um, a reactive. But if instead they do a sort of a, a barn raising with it, which is to say, um, we're lending our support to the hospital's MRI fundraising, the church roof, the school, this, whatever. We're lending it by putting our asset of this thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars of promises in the charity's hands, therefore we have given our our service to that charity. Um, and then when people buy those coupons, they've validated it and they get to be the uh, redeemers of the coupon. So it, it's basically giving it real value by creating it in service. And then having that service realized and show up back in the business's till. Then they've got real money in their, in their till that is the evidence of their circulation and their promissory behavior. So it's, it's basically it's short circuiting. It's collapsing something that we had the components scattered around in time and space and organization going bonk. Easy as pie. Start here. And my concern is too many brush fires in too many directions. I want, I want some coordination. Right, and you had mentioned three components for the credibility of money. I, I wrote down one, must give the money away. What were two and three? I think I skipped, I, did, I didn't catch the... Um, basically, the yeah, they've got to give it away and it's got to be validated as genuine gift of value. Um, and the way that that is realized is somebody puts down 20 bucks on 20 bucks worth of coupons and then gets 20 bucks worth of beer. And the, what would the third be? Is that the realization? I'm not sure. The, well, the, the cycle is creation. Um, validation. The second cycle is validation. That's very important. That's the transfer between hard cash and soft money. It's the interface. It's the edge effect. It's where the rubber and the road really meet. It's where somebody says, yeah, this is good money. It buys beer. And that's, that's the ultimate affirmation is the money buys beer. So the, the last stage is when the coupon is presented, i.e. literally redeemed. So you've got creation, validation, and redemption as the cycle around. Mm -hmm. And we've got it all done to a snap bang. Mm -hmm. um, and Bobby's sharing a bunch of uh, things about advanced market commitments, and, uh, a few other things that are like that. And we can go deeper into, I mean, there, there are many ways to make promises and to have promises act as collateral or as asset or as whatever. I think let's come back to this. Um, Doug, I'm wondering uh, you, your nostril deep in <clears throat> economists trying to figure out how the world uh, needs to be changed or fixed. Um, are they talking about these, it, it, are these kinds of things part of that conversation or are they different or how, what's, how does this work for them? No, economists do not talk about alternative currencies at all. A limited uh, constrained imagination uh, <laughs> and uh, I haven't gone there myself very much because I'm interested in uh, a more cooperative society, not one that's based on the trading of cash in any form. But that's just my own limitation. I mean, I think it's interesting to see what's going to happen. And I hope that, that experiments in new currency light on the existing currency that we have. Like, why do we have it? Where does it come from? Well, uh, why do we only have one, right? I mean, World War, uh, sorry, the, the US Civil War is where the dollar originates and Secretary of uh, Treasury Salmon Chase basically says, hey, we need to finance this war, so let's create a greenback. But in doing so, let's forbid all the banks from doing what they've been doing so far, which is issuing their own local, current, local notes. And I don't know- Currencies go back to uh, collecting taxes in Greece Right. and treating cattle in Mesopotamia. And it's got a, it, it's a very psychological thing. 
how that we can treat these things as real, whereas animals seem to not be able to do that. Good, probably lucky for them, I would say. Yeah, um, animals can't do an awful lot of things. Um, the, the, the issue of our, con uh, we had that conversation this morning about Somalis coordinating in a cultural collaboration. They were cooperative in a context where their host community was less. Our host community in North America, the Western world is very competitive. And um, I think the, uh, the Daniel Schmachtenberger had a really good piece um, a couple of weeks ago where he talked about the, the rivalrous nature of our society being utterly built in. We're just so knee jerk. I won't do it unless I see the money. Um, you know, it's, it's a, your, your point, Doug, Douglas, about where did it come from? It, it basically came from fear and greed. We fear that what we do is not going to be recognized, so I'm not going to do it until I get my piece of gold or my bag of whatever. So it's sort of a, a carrot and stick world that we have created with these value currencies, the dollar, the pound, the euro, whatever. And we've forgotten that the real world is, as in the natural world, one of service and exchange. Things happen. But for them to happen in a cooperative context, it seems to me absolutely essential that we have a cooperative money, just exactly as we are currently bedeviled with a competitive money. We're so much in the competitive money world, we don't even see the damn stuff. So making that transition to and not expand, not get rid of one, have another. It's rather, if you can make it with a co competitive money, why not also have your own? What is the possible negative of having your own money? I mean, one example that uh, comes up when you say that, we, we've been looking at uh, the, the, the two dimensions of, you know, on the one level, volunteerism, we've organized 100,000 hours plus of time, but that's not through intrinsic, that's not through extrinsic incentives, that's intrinsic incentive motivated. But uh, of course we haven't, you know, organized billions of hours of time, which maybe you require extrinsic incentives to reach some kinds of scale that are where, where it's dependent. But what we have found is the motivation of learning is a motivator, the, the, the motivation of uh, creative opportunity to collaborate with others and build social capital. Th these, these, are, these are motivators. And one interesting gap is, you know, that 96% of dollars for doers or volunteer matching grants, if you're familiar with that category, this is employees of large companies go unclaimed each year. In other words, if, you know, 96% of people uh, who work at Fortune 500 companies uh, who don't volunteer, don't allow the volunteer matching grants to flow. So there's billions of dollars each year of unclaimed resources that I, I think in a sense, how do you motivate 10,000 people who work for each of those large companies to collaborate on systems change and how to um, get their help to get the rest of the gap? I mean, I feel like th th that, that's a category of resource that's different from the underlying of an overall economy for all things, but it's a category of, you know, can we incentivize the motivation of people? Can we, can we motivate people to collaborate? And can we have a capital stack of all of the incentives for participation? The other incentive for participation is your own liability. We, we've, we, we want in what we were proposing to Sacramento a couple weeks ago, the idea that any person's risk of forest fire, if you can reduce that by half of air pollution, that you're a stakeholder and you should care darn strongly about that risk. And the same goes for every, every stakeholder um, is, is, you know, you should, you should propose that if you, if you can reduce the risk for any stakeholder, they should care about that. And those existing liabilities are built into the system today. So in other words, one of the largest resources, yes, we have in-kind pledges. I think that's important what you're describing that we can scale pledges as the, the, the basis for credit and the basis for creating things across uh, context. But I think beyond uh, pledges, we have under the, in, the, in the underutilized capital stack for systemic change, there's underutilized capacity to prevent harm, there's underutilized 
consequences of consequences of consequences and stakeholders who are, are uh, could be internal be, become uh, part of uh, turning externalities into internalities in a self-aware system that recognizes the opportunity to to create good and so I think that there's it's getting all of the intrinsic and extrinsic incentives aligned to the, the right um, community gap so that we address social innovation gaps as social impact movement gaps that exist aligned to financialization rather than financialization being seen as foreign I think it's how you get the externalities to become witnessed yes thank you yeah very much other thoughts on this about, about uh, getting people excited about it don't call it system change and don't send them to G well it's I mean uh, just from the start of your description Michael um, we the collective we the United States and the Western civilization uh, back when we created fiat currencies managed to demonize all local currencies we made them illegal and stamped them out mostly I think so that the tax collector could only have one currency to worry about and so that the tax collector could trace all the transactions that were creating value that were taxable. That seems to be the dominant reason. Uh, and the instability of small token type currencies. The, the amount of bank failures across the US um, was yeah. horrible. And every what? time it went down, it took a lot of people with it. So I think there was a lot of good reasons for outlawing the small initiatives. They were just, the big idea brought down to a, a less workable scale. Right. But, but, but similarly, we, we sort of demonized socialism and communism in, the, in this country in the 50s and 60s and 70s mm -hmm. to the point where now when there's viable candidates talking about democratic socialism as a platform, everyone's like, Wah! and in, you know, in the last electoral cycle, there was nothing Bernie Sanders was proposing that isn't already working somewhere in Northern Europe. There was nothing new to the Europeans. They're like, why are these Americans freaking out so bad? Um, so, so I think a piece of the freak out about what you're proposing that every, anybody who, any entity that thinks it could or should create its, its own money ought to go do that is probably embedded in some prohibition that people sense it's like that. There's a taboo on generating your own money and part of what you need to do is hack that taboo. Uh, just like, yep. you know, there used to be a taboo on women smoking in public and the founder of public relations, a guy named Eddie Bernays, uh, yeah. did a, the Torches of Freedom march uh, on, yeah. Easter, on Easter Sunday parade and had young debutantes pull out cigarettes and light up. And suddenly, smoking was fashionable for women and the, and the cigarette company's market just doubled. Yeah. Um, so, bad analogy, perhaps. Um, but, but I'm trying to say that you have, a, you have a cultural hack to do as much as any infrastructure building or storytelling. Yes, and in the States... Um, I always think the U.S. particularly is rather like uh, Spain during the Inquisition. You had the Catholic Church and you had the Inquisition. In the U.S., you've got the Fed and the IRS. Here's the Torches of Freedom March, which has all these super interesting side, uh, side issues. The yep. uh, GW Hill was his client, George Washington Hill, who was the CEO of American Tobacco Company, which sold Lucky Strikes. That was the, his client who said, hey, uh, we need to get women smoking outdoors. <coughs> um, w would somebody like to throw a different uh, issue or topic on the table? Um, drag us in a different direction. Uh, well, may maybe this is a digression or progressive, but uh, solar punk, is that in your brain already? Is that already a known thing to... One word or two? Two words. Ah, my God, it's a Google bomb. I hate it when somebody stumps me on this. So tell us more. So the re I just think it's, it's a, a movement that's become really interesting. It's about nine years old. It has uh, the the caveat that where there is fiction and solar punk it's all based on fact so it's all hyper realistic uh fiction or non-fiction and so the the fiction is all material that you could copy paste into the real world instantly from the fiction and say this is buildable today it's realistic today 
And um, ah, you do have it. Aha. I do. I had it as one word because when I Googled it, it says, do you mean solar punk a single word? And the, the brain uh -huh. is not quite smart enough to figure out making two words one. Wow. Very, very exciting. Uh, just to share for 30 seconds, I, th there's about 2,500 videos in the solar punk genre in the documentary film subgenre. There's about 5,000 paintings and there's about 200 books of novels and short stories at this point. And, and you're saying that these are kind of uh, add water and stir kind of instruction stories? Each of these, look at the documentary films in YouTube. If you search YouTube and solar punk playlists, you'll find uh, hundreds and hundreds of videos, each with a different utopian example and a documentary film about that. Uh -huh. So you can, um, I, I can send a, a, a link to one example, but the, the, Balbo, the Balbo tonic I found there, as uh, example, the Babotonic is, uh, have you ever heard of Living Tree? Sorry, Living Tree what? Uh, this is a for, uh, for Living Tree Construction. So basically they uh, designed, 400 years ago, they figured out you can merge four trees into one organism hmm. and they'll be single. And then they figured out you can do the same thing with 400 trees. In hmm. Germany, they built this, um, this building that is, uh, 12 stories tall, uh, but is entirely living tree construction, where over a 20 year period, the steel, concrete and iron is entirely replaced as the, as the tree grows in. And, and it's 13 years in, and I think it's replaced 70% replaced of it already. And uh, they then, that same firm designed a, um, a future city of 25 million people entirely of living tree construction without steel, concrete or iron that they've been um, publicly talking about the simulations of. And so solar punk were the first people I noticed who uh, identified that. But effectively, you know, that and a thousand other documentary films. I mean, FarmBot is another amazing solar punk subgenre. And there's, there's I, I just think that the, the, the sort of meta category of aspirational, uh, the, 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 fut the, the, the utopian future is uh, here today, but buried unevenly somewhere in the world. Let's find it. It's sort of like citizen journalism for um, solution journalism, except that it's utopianly oriented. And it's, um, and, now, and now there's original solar punk fiction written in 14 languages, someone was telling me the other day, which is kind of interesting. And they had five years to grow in Brazil before it got to the U.S. at all. So it's really not sort of an American-dominated movement. It's more uh, disproportionately non-U.S. based. So I just think it's a really interesting phenomena for where social change aspirational people are convening, where optimism is safe, for, safe from cynicism, I think, is, is the sort of meta category of solar punk in a way. Has anybody else heard of the movements? Not so much. Um, so I didn't have the living tree construction in my brain, but I, did have, I do have farm bots and, uh, and solar punk, but not with the richness of what you've just described. And uh, sort of reminds me of Cory Doctorow's walk away. Um, although it doesn't go into these terms, but it's very much, you know, the, the premise of walk away is a dystopian future where there are normals who live in the cities which have fallen into a mess. And then there are people who walked away into what would appear to be uninhabitable regions of the world, except that through molecular fabrication and the cloud and whatever else, uh, people can actually create uh, building materials and have enough water and power and everything else and connect, connect themselves up to the grid such that they can kind of live any place and make as beautiful a place as they want. And when the normals show up and try to take over these things, they're, they, they're trying not to have weapons and not to, you know, not to become a weaponized uh, society. So their answer is to walk away because they know that you know, they can fab a new, a new town with, complete with a Japanese hot uh, bath um, any place they want to, and they'll fix the mistakes they made last time because they've learned and thought about the plan and they're always updating the plan, which lives in the cloud. And so in some sense, the, the solar punk seems to be um, how do we share these plans? How do we sit down and, and write about this? And um, is um, is open ocean sailing something uh, like would be that would be considered solar punk? Uh, the guy I talked to this guy long ago who was trying to figure out how do you open source? How do you design an open source technologies that would let us let us thrive while living on the oceans? Hmm. 
So how do you harvest how, how do you harvest energy from the waves and the sun? How do you grow plants? How do you, you know, the, the whole the whole kit and caboodle? Yeah, I mean, I think it's solar punk is a broad frame in that sense that it's anything that is um, aspirationally future oriented, compatible with sustainable living, but not uh, diluting ourselves about the problems that technology can't solve, yeah. but um, sort of seeking to uh, solve all the problems that we're not solving with it today that are very solvable with it. It sounds like it's also a little bit related to Afrofuturism. Uh, tell me about Afrofuturism. I'm, I'm not so there's, that there's, familiar. Yeah, so uh, let me share screen again. Ba -ba -da. So here's all, I will fill out more on, on Solarpunk. Uh, but Afrofuturism is both an aesthetic, um, it's, it's both a, 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 an artistic movement, but also like a blend of magic realism and science fiction. Um, and Octavia Butler is a sci-fi author who kind of wrote in that. Basquiat is a, is a painter. Uh, Sun Ra, I think, is a, a famous character in the middle of all this uh, in the experimental music realm. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a blend of art and science. Um, and then um, Black Panther was very much affected by Afrofuturist visions. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so take a gander over into Afrofuturism. And I'll take a look at Walk Away by Cory Doctorow too. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I, I know Corey personally, so if you want to talk to him, let me know. He, I, I read Walk Away as a galley that he gave me. Um, here's the Afrofuturistic designs of Black Panther. I'll post, uh, actually, I'm going to post a link to Afrofuturism in my brain to our chat. So you've got it handy. Um, huh. Anybody else? Does this trigger any thoughts for anyone else on the call? Adjacencies are fine. Um, I, I really like when people try to posit optimistic futures. I doubly like it when they start designing things and open sourcing them and sharing them out. I triply like it when they connect all these things with plot, story, context, humans, etc. And even nicer when they actually Play these things out and try to build them. So, so it's a to me it's a really rich, it's a really rich vein. Well, I don't want to be negative here, but that I always be. starts a negative statement, Doug. <laughs> you know that. Um, I'm concerned for how the optimistic futurists play out against scenarios of what we do to stop climate change and cut back on fossil fuels. Uh, it seems to me that any plausible scenario of cutting back on fossil fuels is very disruptive for contemporary society and hard to imagine how it recoalesces with the population that we have now. Uh, take food transportation, for example. Most of our food is transported. If we cut down the use of fossil fuels, the transportation of food would be vastly limited. Are we creative enough to uh, make up for the difference locally? And what about the large number of places on the earth that are not capable of sustainable growing? So it's a whole bunch of concerns that are basically, let's put our positive ideas against difficult scenarios and see if we can find a way through. So what, I, I, and I love this question and I'll just throw a tiny thing in. I just recently met in the last couple of weeks, the founder of Blend Hub. I'll put a link on in a second. Uh, and Blend Hub, basically he's, uh, he's making powdered food, but highly nutritious powdered food. And I, I'm a Michael Pollan fan, so I'm a, I'm a big believer, like eat food, mostly plants, not too much. But uh, the, the, one of the key inventions he's come up with is a portable factory that basically ships as one or two containers. And you can drop this any place. And his idea is to put this either near the source of the raw materials or the source of demand and to use it to create high nutrition powdered foods that anybody can afford, anybody can get. Shabing should just move it the hell out. Um, and, you know, here I'm thinking of Soylent, which is, you know, this uh, mildly sexy uh, food supplement invented in Silicon Valley because geeks wanted to be able to sit in front of their terminals 24-7 and not have to worry about what to eat next, et cetera, et cetera. 
but then I'm also thinking about urban farming and ways of actually distributing the growing of food right into the places where food needs to be eaten, which would dramatically lower uh, fuel consumption the way you're saying, Doug. So I, th I think there's a variety of people tackling this thing. I, I think that there is um, a way to also get there in alignment to that. Include food production. What we got is can save its health gains from biophilia, pay for any um, city because um, at a much greater level. And so, if, if in other words, if if you have um, biophilia. Uh, where the plants are free and the food is extra value, you can effectively grow much more in cities and than than previously thought thought feasible. It, it's 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 just the point is that if if you take the apple as the the end goal, you're not going to get there. But if you take the progression of a thousand different kinds of fruit plants are necessary to achieve mental health goals in the city, and you look at the um, mental health gains from biophilia. It's, it's a large part of economic cost, air pollution likewise. So I think that if in whole cost accounting, I do think there's a way to increase the biophilia density to botanical garden scale density. And those kind of responses can also be resilience approaches for, for global warming uh, context too. They can help provide more green from cities. Uh, Doug, again, um, are the economists that you're talking to tackling major economic strategies for mitigating climate change or are they off the climate change conversation? Like, like, are they talking about what happens when we cut fossil fuel use, pretend that we managed to cut fossil fuel use dramatically, what happens then? Well, I wish they were, but my experience is that they're looking at how to get from this economy to a green economy where they could make more money. Mm. And the, the, the depth of understanding of that is very limited. I mean, for example, the idea that if the cost of generating electricity with solar panels was less than generating it by fossil fuels, then the argument is everybody would switch. Well, in the U.S., 55% of the homes are heated by gas, and 80% use gas for cooking and hot water heating. And so if you have a home, you can't just switch from... Uh, uh, solar produced electricity uh, and get rid of your gas furnace without paying about uh, for the three appliances, maybe on the order of $5,000 for installation, renovation, and so on to make the switch. Uh, and people just don't see that kind of contingency. They just imagine that if the price of solar energy was the same as fossil fuel energy, people could just switch. It ain't so easy. And I don't see economists facing those arguments. I have some that might be related here. Please. Uh, I live in the Bay Area, I live in Marin County. And um, I'm looking at uh, the threat of sea level rise. You know, the, we've already had nine inches of, uh, the Bay is nine inches higher now than it was in, I think, the 1980s. And it's increasing. And as anybody who's been watching the news knows, uh, Greenland and uh, the ice caps are melting at a much higher rate than previously predicted. So um, there was recently an article in the local paper that said there's 10,000 houses at risk of flooding in Marin County by 2100. It's probably closer to 2045. So I've been interviewing some people in the area to try and get a sense of what's going on. My feeling is that there's a lot of really good, good work that's been done by folks like Spur. They've got a whole atlas on, on this. Um, uh, individual uh, municipalities and counties have done a lot of work, but there's not a lot of good collaboration occurring across boundaries because there's so many different entities. There's the Coastal Commission, there's ABAC, there's the Army Corps of Engineers, and these mm. people do not know how to talk across boundaries to each other. So as I've been interviewing, last week I interviewed the uh, watershed planner from Marin County and asked her what keeps her up at night. And, you know, it's infrastructure. Most of our uh, infrastructure is at sea level. And a one foot rise is going to be a real problem. Plus, in the event, it, it, looking at Marin County in particular, 101, everything east of 101 is built on landfill, essentially. All of that was bay that's been filled in. So there's some talk among certain people that um, 101 could be the berm. Everything to the west of 101 would be saved, everything to the east would go. 
If that happens, RIN loses about 85% of its tax base because that's where all the businesses that generate tax come from. And then you've got to pay people to buy their land back and to mitigate this managed retreat and then move them somewhere else. So do you open up open space and build more billion dollar homes or do you do high density infill? And it very quickly becomes a nightmare of epic proportions with all of these different layers of complexity and problems coming in where you just want to throw your hands up and say, I give up, I can't do it. So as I've been sitting with that, my God, how do we cope with this? The question that's come up for me is in how to create public conversations that don't look at those problems so much as ask the question of who do we need to become in order to handle this? Because if we stay with the old version of economics, if we stay with we've got to make money in all these things, we're doomed. But if we can say we're being called to a larger sense of community, a larger sense of working together, then I think we stand a chance. And I don't know, you know, my hope is to try and put together a pilot program that I can get funded by a community foundation so I can do some of this collaboration work. I don't know how successful I'll be. I've got a partner on this that we're working on doing this. But that, that question of who do we need to become in order to cope with these really large challenges is just ringing louder and louder in my ears with the desire to let's get some, you know, start bringing people together in, in 50 or 200 folks at a time and having these conversations of what's important and, and recognizing the immensity of the challenges before us, that there's going to be a lot of things that we will not have. What could we do and, and how can we start to address that? So that's, that's kind of the stuff that's taking on agenda these days. One concern that I have with scenarios like that is we're going to, as the world is in difficulty, everybody's going to want to come here to Napa Valley and Sonoma. There's like all sorts of interesting things about climate refugeeism that nobody's really dealing with, like any number of things. The survivalists who are really smart, uh, who actually manage to, you know, store away some food or do whatever, they're going to be assaulted. People are going to come after the assets they've created. So the best survivalist strategy, to my mind, is to create resilient communities, like to, to make sure it's much bigger than just you and your plot of peas and, and potatoes, because otherwise you're hosed. Um, and, and, and then, you know, I think um, the Netherlands is going to become really important to everybody. Um, cause you, you know, they've stolen land from the sea forever, uh, through poldering and they understand, you know, water. And, and by the way, this, this actually goes back to this morning's conversation about wiki culture and culture, uh, generally as well. There's a really nice book titled Amsterdam, um, that talks about basically the origins of Dutch culture and that the Dutch never had a feudal era. Um, they basically um, started stealing land from the sea, figured out how to do that, used windmills to pump the water out. But everybody knew that everybody had to help, get, you know, keep the dikes up and make up. It, it, it forced a collaborative culture among them. And then they got this really um, thick layer of rich merchants because they invented uh, a kind of ship uh, that lets you uh, fillet herring while you're out on the ship. It's kind of a, a wide, a beamy, a, a beamy fishing vessel that lets you process all the herring out there. And they invented a special kind of herring known as Holland herring, where you leave the spleen and the liver in the filleted fish, and the enzymes in the spleen and the liver basically pickle the herring in a much nicer, sweeter way. So Holland herring becomes a premium barreled herring across Europe in that era. The merchants become fat and happy. Um, so you have this very thick middle class of, of people doing business, uh, doing stuff that, that's really interesting. And it creates a collaborative culture that, that others are, are busy trying to emulate. So sorry for the digression, but, but I started thinking about how do we build, how do we, how do we fend off the rising sea levels for some time, which is going to happen everywhere. Like um, the biggest cities in the world are mostly located uh, on estuaries at where rivers meet, meet you know, oceans, and they're all too close to the water, and they're all going to have a hell of a time. Um, uh, and I think some of you know this, but back... Um, Uh, so at some point a couple of years ago, in a, in a huff, after a conversation at a conference about global climate change and how we're all ignoring it, and this is probably at least 10 years ago, I bought the domain globalwarmingrealestate.com. 
Uh, I've rebuilt the website that I put up on there. It's a, it's a spoof site. It basically says, if you don't believe the science, maybe you see a business opportunity. And it, you know, I posit that all the first floor lobbies are gonna need to be turned into aquaria. Uh, the second or third floor uh, windows will need to be turned into doorways with docks. I invent H2O motors, which will invent the SUV of, of the new urban, uh, you know, the new urban city. Uh, because who needs just a simple little ski do or a jet ski? We need like the big monster truck, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Back to all of you in the booth. Um, Howard, at, at PNCA, it's a design school. A lot of it, I think, is gra graphic design, art design, but and and some of it is like I'm sure some of those kids care a lot about social issues and are trying to do graphic design for social good. How, how much traction do any of these issues have there, and what are they saying? Yeah, I would say that um, a hundred percent of the students are very concerned, aware of, and concerned of the kind of issues that we're we're talking about especially equity issues, equity issues in large, as well as climate. And um, so, you know, <clears throat> well, in my, own, in my own curriculum development, I'm focusing on, on projects, right? So the students engage in projects in the world. And uh, the challenge is to um, uh, cultivate skills that the students can offer to the to these projects so that it becomes a, a value proposition rather than merely a case study and so the projects that i bring into the classroom are more kind of manageable scale right um and so in the foresight upcoming foresight class our focus will on will be on mobility and uh students will be taking largely a uh, uh, you know, futures ethnography type of type approach, interviewing people who are working on mobility issues, and you know, Delphi and and um, scanning and etc. And um, in the systems class, uh, I've got three projects coming up. One on uh, one with a group called the Alaka Alliance, which is a, a group working out of Newport, Oregon, to reintroduce the sea otter to the Oregon coast. The sea otter has been Alaka is the Chinook word for sea otter. Um, it's been missing in Oregon for a hundred years or more. Um, uh, and uh, you, as you probably know, missing because of the, um, its value as a fur. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, a, a, a nearly exterminated from, from the west coast of North America. And those remnant populations have, have returned somewhat, but not in Oregon returned quite a bit, but not in Oregon. And, and the uh, Alaka or the sea otters uh, are um, uh, vitally important to the coastal ecosystem, right? For kelp uh, uh, growth and seagrass growth, right? Because without the sea otter, then the urchins. So it's a, it's a classic state of, uh, of uh, alternative stable states, right? So you've got a uh, kelp dominated ecosystem or urchin dominated ecosystem. And the Alaka is the, uh, the trophic cascade between the two is, is catalyzed by the sea otter, right? So that's one of the projects that we'll be working on. Um, I like to work with early stage projects because that gives, you know, they, they haven't maybe fully conceptualized what they're all about, or maybe the students can help them to conceptualize it, you know, with various, various diagramming techniques. Um, um, another one that we're working with is, is the Haas Institute out of Berkeley, H-A-A-S Institute out of Berkeley, program on targeted universalism. So this is a policy approach to thinking about equity design for, for equity. Um, the idea here being that um, universalist policy design um, uh, um, is um, you know leaves out uh, certain populations that are uh, uh, don't have access, and that targeted policy design um, uh, is uh, inherently discriminatory or can be challenged as such in the courts. And so, targeted universalism, trying to combine the best of the two, and I, I highly recommend uh, the podcast I can put in the chat here, but with uh, John Powell, John A. Powell on. Um, 
interview with him on, on targeted universalism. And the third project that we're going to take on, which I mentioned to Jerry a, a few weeks ago, is this one um, uh, by a, a guy in, in the Portland area, Thompson Morrison, who is has used Ward's Feder Ward Cunningham's federated wiki to write about his experience in what he calls agile learning or agile education, trying to bring that into high school um, classes throughout, um, starting in Dayton, Oregon, and now throughout the state of Oregon. So here's, yeah, I, uh, I did not know about Thompson Morrison before we had our, our beer and dinner. And so here's, uh, here's what I put in after visiting with you, Howard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I loved, I loved reading his book myself. You know, I love pattern languages. As Jerry mentioned this morning on the call this morning, the Federated Wiki, you might uh, consider it uh, a, a tool for writing pattern languages, at least thus far, that seems to how it seems to be how it's being used. Um, yeah. yeah, so I enjoyed reading his book in that format and following it uh, along. He, he now has a manuscript and so we'll see how it, um, we'll see how the experience differs. He's sending his, me his manuscript. Uh, this is the wiki that is the manuscript at, up at this point, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, he's, been, he's been basically doing a single author wiki using federated wiki to write this book. Right. Cool. Thank, thank you, Howard. That, that, that was a lot of um, super interesting stuff. Um, Gene, um, where are you finding traction, energy, interest in trying to fix some of the systems problems that you care about? <laughs> Damn it. You're supposed to say, yes, I like right here. Look. Mm, the first rule of systems thinking is not to talk about systems thinking. And there is no uh, fight club. I am simply spending time endeavoring to provoke thought. I, I can't change people's minds. Only they can do that. The best I can possibly hope to do is to ask questions in a manner that will get them to think. And, and so... I connect with people on an ongoing basis and we have discussions about what's on their mind. I, I, I stopped pushing agendas because the natural thing is for people to become defensive. So I, don't, I don't, don't push agendas anymore. I simply ask questions. And, and, it, and you know, it seems to To work to some extent, but I, I have no idea the extent to which it works. Mm -hmm. um, but I get a lot of thank yous from people um, telling me that they have a different view of things based upon the, the thoughts that were provoked. And, yeah, which is you. why I said I'm, I'm a recovering systems thinker because, you know, the, We've been trying to sell systems thinking for the last eight decades since the work of Bertolamfi in the 30s. And for the most part, the world isn't buying. And, and I have come, I think, to understand why they're not buying. And it has to do with how much of what I have to offer you are you willing to listen to right after I tell you you're stupid? Probably not much. So... I don't talk to people about systems thinking anymore. I talk to them about relationships and their implications. And, and I don't get the pushback that I used to get trying to explain systems thinking to them. I ask them about, if you do this, what's the implication? And what's the implication of that? And, and the implication of that? And what are the influences? And, and they think about things rather than simply cause and effect. It extends their perspective on, on thinking about multiple relationships. And sometimes I even get them to draw diagrams. It's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> because if, stop and think about it. You cannot hold more than one thought in your head at the same time. 
that though if you look at a diagram of multiple relationships, you get a sense of multiple relationships simultaneously, which gets you beyond cause and effect, rather than simply looking at one, the result of, of one action. And, and you know, the, I think I told you before that, that workshop that absolutely blew my mind, it was an accident. To, to start with a group of 35 people and, and that I didn't realize was going to be a workshop until a few minutes before it became a workshop. And starting out and saying, take out a piece of paper and on the piece of paper, draw a dot and label it cat. And a few inches away from it, draw another dot and label it mouse. Now draw an arrow from cat to mouse and label it chases. You've now created your first relationship model and if you feel faint, you should leave now. And for four hours, this group of 35 people were absolutely out of control. And within four hours, they were drawing extremely complex relationship diagrams and using them to tell stories to other people in the room. They had a completely different perspective on how to look at multiple relationships and unfold them as stories to provide meaning more meaning to them than they had about the subjects of interest beforehand, before we started, and to convey meaning to other people. The, the connection I made, some, I know is I spent years, maybe decades, developing relationship models and inflicting them on other people. And I would send them to other people because I wanted to impress them with how smart I was. And they really didn't care. Um, and after the things I sent them made their heads hurt for a while. And they'd send back a note like, well, that's nice. What they really wanted to say is, why the hell did you send this to me? Because I didn't give it to them in a manner that they could understand. And, and one day I accidentally made this connection between a relationship model and a play. If you go to the play and you sit there, you watch the relationships unfold between the actors from one act to another. And it tells a story. And when you leave the play, you take the story with you. Suppose the playwright walked up to you, handed you the script, and five minutes later said, what do you think? There is no way to comprehend what's in that script in five minutes. So I began to build relationship models and unfold them as a story and, and do a voiceover so people could see the model unfold as opposed to write papers that were indecipherable. And, and people tell me that, that they begin to sense the value of telling stories with relationship models as opposed to just building systems thinking diagrams. And the one I built about um, Aesop's fable, The Boy Who Cries Wolf, just to prove a point. It's really marvelous in terms of the way that that story unfolds as a relationship model. So. I would love for the relationship modeling that you described to be something that people discover across the million social innovations that have ever happened and the real data about the real world in terms of which social innovations could solve hypothetically which problems where. In other words, it strikes me that there's some automatic uh, creation of relationship models that people could interact with in a simulation to say, what are, the, what are all the causes and effects that are in, you know, for example, WISIP, you could see um, 40 years of cost benefits analysis history that have been studied in meta-analysis since, since 1972, uh, this link here, for example. And if you take, you know, all of the meta-analyses that have already been done to say, here are some interventions. Now, obviously we want not only the interventions, but on innovations, but at least even if you just took the historical data it seems like understanding cause, potential cause and consequence for stakeholders is something that could be simulated in a more general way. In other words, these relationships could be discovered through interacting with our aspirations. I feel like every person should adopt a future 2050, 2040, whatever the date is that they prefer rather than what's gonna happen without their existence on earth and then work like the demon to get the 
social innovation density of the world to the scale where their alternative history of the world is possible. And that's sort of what it means to adopt it. And then, so I think the, the consequence, the relationship of cause and effect in terms of hypothetical and counterfactual social innovation, I feel like that's the agency and self-authorship that I'd love to see from relationship mapping. I've enjoyed some of your YouTube videos, Gene, in terms of Kumu that I owe sub universe and appreciate your contributions to the, the, the thought process. I'm just sort of saying that I'd, I'd love for that. Uh, maybe it's a choose your own adventure story about alternative history of the world, the future of the world. And then, you know, each person fills in the blank of what things ought to get applied as social innovation to get their preferred versus their not preferred alternative history. But I do feel like there needs to be a narrative interface to deal with that. We don't have a semantic web of social change. We, just have these million stories but even at a narrative level at a relationship level we should be able to take the data we have and the data we wish for and connect that into a matrix of, of self-authorship well i'm going to say I'm that uh, uh, shifting from systems thinking to competing narratives is a huge step the whole feeling of a system, talk, talking systems, is being a heavy weight. Talking about competing narratives is like having a handful of butterflies. It's really alive, it's quite different. And getting people to think in terms of working narratives against each other seems to me like a good method. No scientific paper comes out without being embedded in a narrative. The problem is the narrative is usually implicit and people don't take responsibility for them. We're not teaching people how to do alternative narratives, and it's a real mistake. We're not teaching young folk. Some of them like get this, and so, I don't know how miraculously they get it better than I do, but, the, but sort of the bulk of them are not learning how to see the, the embedded assumptions, uh, the, the context, never mind the history of a lot of life situations. So, um, makes it hard to question why the thing you're staring at doesn't make that much sense. Huh. Well, we've ended up with a handful of butterflies, which is a nice place to, to land, I think. Um, and, and I was reflecting in the middle of, of the call that I think everybody on this call has spent a great proportion of their life energy trying to affect how other people think. Uh, maybe sometimes trying to directly change their minds, but I appreciate, Gene, your emphasis on that being a fruitless endeavor sometimes. Uh, but certainly, um, every one of us trying to figure out how to get people to open up or, or shift their perspective or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, change the scripts in their heads is one way I sometimes talk about it. The place that I finally concluded, or the point that I finally rested on, is that people always, always, always do exactly what makes the most amount of sense to them in the context of the moment based on their current understanding. And, and I, I can't find an argument to violate that because even if you attempt to act incoherently, you're doing it with an intent. In Go ahead, John. Increasingly, I've worked on the idea that it's not changing people's minds, it's getting them to discover their own mind. Mm -hmm. And they can't change their mind to something which isn't kind of potent within them anyway. So well, you might as well work on that. Well, within so for example, I've been thinking about the teaching of poetry. We teach poetry as, oh, kids, here's this great poem written by this genius. Wrong approach. Much more important is, here's this interesting poem. What does it stir up in you? Let's learn how to deal with your own experience as you listen to this poem. Totally different. Um, John, you were going to jump in? A question. Uh, to Gene's point, are you describing survivorship bias? Is that what humans at the moment are afflicted by? That's what I will. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to... I would have to think about whether or not survivorship bias 
connects to the statement that I made. The, the, the statement simply seems universal so that if somebody is operating with survivor bias, it's based upon the, what makes sense to them in the moment based on their current understanding, which, which, which to me all folds back to what Cubby said in the seven habits. And he said, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So that if you do something that makes no sense to me, it's not because of something you don't understand, it's because of something I don't understand. If I were you, I would take the same action. If I were you with the same understanding that you have in that context, in that moment, I would do what you did. So that, that what you do doesn't make sense, it's because of something I don't understand. So it causes me to stop and think rather than react more often than not. Ken, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap questions. it up in another couple of minutes. Yes, more questions. It was a pleasure. Good to see you all. Take care. Super glad you joined us. Thank you. Enjoy Marin while it's still there. Before it's overrun by, by uh, Syrian refugees or Bangladeshi refugees who two thirds of Bangladesh is at sea level, right? Yeah. Crazy stuff like that. Uh, I would just uh, offer in um, response and support of all that Jean just said and um, almost everybody else in the same context is um, let them drink beer. If, if, if the money buys you beer, um, people will take it seriously. It's that simple. Got to, got to embed these behaviors in what people want to do already. So I, you just coined the name for what your movement. It's called the Beer Revolution. You remember this morning, um, Dan, what's his name? The, the guy who led the, on the, the wiki. Um, uh, which, sorry, which, which of the people? The, <laughs> yeah, which of the people? <clears throat> the one who liked the stop sign. Uh, Pete Kaminsky. Pete Kaminsky said that this was the um, human machine interface that he felt was one of the most interesting there was, uh, the stop sign. And it doesn't have to be physically interactive, it's very present, mm -hmm. social behavior that has a consequence. Similarly, the white line down the middle of the road, it's a very, very profound device. It moves people in different places. And we need some more sort of white line stop sign procedures that people just find convenient and effective and serve them. And just, to just to show how complicated these things are. So I grew up partly in Argentina and Argentine drivers are notoriously bad. But one of the interesting things was that there were, there were lines on the pavement. It's just that nobody obeyed them. So uh, normally traffic in Argentina looked like a school of fish. And I got to drive, I got to drive in Argentina once as an adult. And I realized that it's just like a school of fish. You're allowed, you could go from the far right to the far left of a five lane road. And if you do it in small increments, nobody gives a shit. You can drive on top of the white line. Nobody cared. Now this is probably no longer true, but, but, but back in, you know, roll back 25 years and it, this is how people drove. But if you, if you turn too sharply, bam, you know, horns, whatever people, you know, glaring at you. So, so, as long as you you're, you were you know obeying school of fish behavior, you could kind of do anything, and the lines the lines were unimportant in that sense. And at, at the at the limit line, they would stop for a red light. They would mostly do that. But at the limit line, there'd be cars jammed in between other cars, you know, overlapping whatever. Um, and then back to Pete's comment about stop signs. I'm a big fan of traffic calming, where what you do is you remove stop signs and you you insert things like roundabouts, and even so grudgingly. But when you do pace matching and everybody doesn't have to bring their energy to a full halt, you actually get better throughput, fewer accidents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so even a simple thing like a hexagonal red stop sign is a complicated affair when you start digging into what would you use, how would you use it, where would you put it, do people understand it, does it help? But it's not magic. And it's not magic, that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, anyone with uh, last words for this call? I just wanted to say thank you, Jerry, for convening this excellent conversation of humans. I appreciate that uh, we've 
been able to iterate uh, forward progress of uh, discovering a mental frame set by the end of the conversation that is um, a more useful toolkit than I arrived with. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you all for showing up with your full human selves and minds and all of that. I just, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Until next. Thanks, everybody.